What's up, buddy? Yeah, I figure I'd kind of talk about this a little bit. <clears throat> you know, you know, I, I know how a lot of us feel about reboots and stuff and, 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 and remakes and retcons and, you know, sometimes we're okay with it and sometimes we're not okay with it. Sometimes we're fans of it, sometimes we're not fans of it. But then when you take a look at certain properties from the past that you feel definitely could use a reboot, especially in today's world, in today's media, there are certain properties out there that seem to be, that seem to have gone forgotten, but, you know, could still have the potential to really take it to another level. Uh, in, in in today's media, especially when it comes to animation. Now, I understand that sometimes we get constant reboots and all that of shows, even if it's been years after they've come out. You know, I, I, re I remember when TMNT 2003 came out, and it wasn't even seven years. Well, actually, it had been seven years since the original TMNT ended. And it hadn't even been five years, <coughs> excuse me, six to five years since the next mutation ended. So, it was, um, you know, so it was kind of a surprise to hear that another Ninja Turtles was coming. And that this one was going to be more faithful to what Mirage, to the, what the Mirage comics were uh, than what the original, what the uh, previous uh, animated and even live action shows were. <clears throat> now, with that said, you know, that could be made as an exception because it's almost, almost been a decade. Almost. But then there are times where you get a reboot and all that of something that hasn't even been out, that the original hasn't even been out that long. It's been only a few years, and now all of a sudden you're getting a reboot. Now, when it comes to movies, this is obviously common. You know, you take a look at Spider-Man, wasn't even what? Wasn't even, what, a couple of years? And all of a sudden we had The Amazing Spider-Man, and then we had Amazing Spider-Man 2. And now they're thinking of rebooting that for the MCU universe. Now, the, now they're thinking of rebooting that in some way for the because of the deal between Sony and Marvel for the MC universe, for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And then you got things like Fantastic Four. It's not even been a well, I guess it has been a decade, or well, not even that. That, and all of a sudden we're getting another Fantastic Four movie. And this one's coming under a lot of fire because of some of the controversial casting decisions. But it hadn't even been that long. Really. I mean, maybe a decade or so. I gotta look at the movies. Maybe a decade or so. So yeah, it's acceptable to do a reboot then, but still, I don't think the sequel, it hadn't even been a decade for the sequel. You know, and then you take a look at the, you take a look at Hulk. You know, and the Incredible Hulk. Just saying. You know, that one wasn't even, what was it, not even a decade, and then they did the Incredible Hulk after Iron Man, or after Iron Man 2 or something like that. So it wasn't even a decade. The, the point is, you know, sometimes, there will be certain media mediums that will get reboots and retcons, you know, a lot sooner than they should. And sometimes, like I said, with with the Ninja Turtles cartoon, Oon, and and maybe even let's say Fantastic Four. You know, like I said, maybe even Fantastic Four, the the idea to reboot them maybe a little over a decade or close to a decade later, you know, it sounds okay in everything, but 
if you're doing it within the same decade, it's like, you know, in, in, like I said, if you're doing it within the same decade, you know, it's like, what's the point? Now, some people might accept the fact that, you know, when Ninja Turtles did their reboot for the cartoon series in 2003, it had been five, five years since Snake's Mutation and six years, or seven years since uh, the original run. Now, the reason people would be willing to accept that is because we were in a new decade, if not a new millennium, and a new century. So that was acceptable. You were basically really starting over if you take a look at it. You know, but when it comes to remakes happening within the same decade, now like I said, you know, Fantastic Four, yeah, it's been about, I think, 10 years since the first movie, I believe, and then maybe less than that since the sequel. So I can understand that. But then you take a look at Spider-Man, like I said, and it hadn't even been a decade since the first movie came out, and already they were doing a, a remake, and the remake was happening only a few years after the third movie of the original trilogy. See what I'm saying? So I know that sounds kind of confusing and everything, but my point is, when I look at reboots and remakes and everything, I can understand that there's a certain time frame you should do them in. When it comes to comics, there are certain time frames you should do them in. Archie Comics didn't really reboot the Sonic comics, if people put it that way, or softly reboot or softly retcon them, until about 2011, 2012. Yeah, they really didn't do it until almost two, almost like two, three years ago. Everything had kept basically within the same continuity, same context, same timeline, <coughs> you know, you name it. Everything was kept within that. Everything that had happened and was written by previous writers was still acknowledged. It was. But, after they did Worlds Collide, here you go. Except after they did Worlds Collide, the soft retcon and reboot with the Sonic comic happened, and the rest is history. So, with that said, with that said, a lot of people are always cautious about reboots and retcons. Sometimes, comic book companies like, say, an Archie or a Marvel or a DC might do a Red Corner or a reboot a little too soon. A couple of years ago, DC did what was known as the New 52, and that because of that, you have a lot of the DC animated, you have a lot of the DCU, a lot of the DCU, the, the DC Cinematic, or the DCAU, uh, the DC Cinematic Animated Universe start following suit with that starting with the um, uh, Justice League starting with the Justice League movie and then following that up with a few follow-up films like Batman and Son Batman vs. Robin you know, or Son of Batman, Batman and Ro you know, Batman vs. Robin, you know, Justice League Throne of Atlantis, you know, and these were all set in the new 52 universe. So, as great as that is, all of a sudden, a few years later, current time present, if you will, you have DC doing another reboot, and this time, they're basically resetting things to the way they were. And then you take a look at Marvel, they're doing a reboot with their, they're doing something similar to what DC did with the New 52, and they're kind of getting their own take on it with, with the aftermath of Secret Wars. So, with that all said and everything, 
again, I know people are cautious about reboots, about certain properties being rebooted, retconned, you know, and, you know, basically recreated for a new generation. I know they are. But then, there are properties that, like I said at the beginning, are sort of gone and forgotten. You know, that you know they exist, that for some other reason you know they exist, but to many they are all but gone and forgotten because of the fact that they never really had a chance to, you know, spread their wings and fly, if you will. You know, they never had a really, a, a real chance to, you know, put the foot down and show what they can do. And when I take a look at the library of animated shows back in the 80s, some that stand, up, st some that stand out to me as possible you know, choices for reboots and retcons are those that didn't even last a season, if not two. One in particular, and I want to thank Warner Brothers for introducing me to this through the Saturday morning cartoons volume for the 1980s, and as well as thank Mr. 80s, DJ Adder, or Arter, or Adder, uh, for sending me the three disc deal. <laughs> um, one show in particular that obviously had the potential to really be good because of the fact it was an action adventure show, due to the fact it was part of. Boomerang's Boomer Action Block, and that show is Goldie Golden Action Jack. And I take a look at that, and yes, 1981, they can get away with a little bit more. I mean, heck, they have a freaking scene in, what was it, The Curse of the Snake Men, or Snake People, where Goldie Gold is taking a bubble bath in a huge freaking pool, Ooh, which I guess is her tub. And she's actually covered up with the bubbles and everything when she reaches for something to catch the, the snake in or the cobra in that's going after her. Because apparently the snake people sent a cobra after her. So, again, long story short, you know, back in the 80s you could get away with a little bit more, especially something like that. But my point is, you take a look at those 13 episodes of Goldie Gold if you've seen them you had the fortune enough to see him. And, you know, as much as Rowdy C says this is kind of like one of those, like, out there kind of shows, he even acknowledged it's not one of the worst. That it has potential. In a sense, he's acknowledged that Goldie Gold has potential, or had potential to be a good show. And that's why I think that if any show that Warner Brothers should license out because they have the Hanna Barbera and Ruby Spears library. If there's any show they should license out, out for for a reboot for this new generation, especially in today's world, it's Goldie Golden Action Jack. I think this show, this property, has the potential to make a comeback in today's media, in today's animation, whether it's 2D animated, flash drawn, flash animation, or CGI, it has the potential to really be good. It really does. Now I know some people might say, well Brian, there's a problem. That problem is the fact that Goldie Gold and Action Jack, yeah, they're part of Ruby Spears, and that's part of the Warner Brothers Library, but guess what? They were animated by Marvel. Here's the deal though. Ruby Spears licensed Marvel to do the animation. Marvel doesn't own Goldie Golden Action Jack. Ruby Spears does. And Ruby Spears owns Goldie Golden Action Jack. And thus, because the library is owned by them, Warner Brothers owns Goldie Golden Action Jack. You know, so to me,
So to me, I think in a sense, I think in a sense, Goldie Gold, in my opinion, in Action Jack, this property has the, the, uh, the potential to really make a huge comeback in today's medium and today's animation. I mean, you take a look at a lot of the shows that they had from Kim Possible in the past decade, like I've mentioned, like Kim Possible. You know, you have My Little Pony, which is a popular one among all genres, if you will, in all genders. You have My Little Pony. You have, you know, if you had shows like Kim Possible, you know, the list could go on uh, of other shows out there. You know, you have Black Widow as a, as a good character that can carry her own show. You know, Black Widow, um, Captain Marvel, Karen Dan Danders. Carol Danders, you know, you have the new Miss Marvel, you have a, you have X-23 becoming freaking Wolverine in the rebooted, um, in the post-Secret Wars uh, reboot of Marvel. You have a freaking female Thor. You know, and again, the list could go on. You have Mary Jane sort of at times as an alter ego superhero called Jackpot. And if you want the staple of all staples, how about Wonder Woman? Supergirl, Batgirl, the list could go on. The point is, the, the, the point is what I'm trying to make, to make here is the fact that you take a look at all that, not just in animation but in comics, and all these female leads that are come, all these female roles and leads, you know, she-Hulk, for example. And again, like I said, the potential is there. The potential is there for something like Goldie Gold and Action Jack to really make a mark, really make a foot, really put the foot down in today's medium. And I believe a rebooted Goldie Gold and Action Jack could do it. I really do. I mean, you know, they can, I mean, if they can reboot Scooby-Doo constantly, you know, why not give shows like this, properties like Goldie Golden Action Jack a shot? I mean, from what I've seen, the potential is there. The storylines could be great. I mean, the environment, I mean, everything is, everything just could really work in today's, with today's world. I mean, you can update everything. As far as like her get her Goldie gadgets go, I mean every I mean everything has a possibility. I mean the storylines are great. You could do more with in today's in today's medium than you could back could back in the eighties. I mean heck, back in the eighties, you never really could get an origin story of how someone like Goldie Gold, you know, inherited her money or how her inheritance came to be. Here in today's world, you could do that. You could do that, and it, people would get invested in these kind of stories. I really, I, it, they, they could get invested. And I really think Warner Brothers, to me, to coin a phrase, has a gold mine on their hands with Goldie Gold and Action Jack. All they have to do is just reboot it, you know, like I say, update it for today's world, and away you go. I mean, and, and you could do so much more. I mean, the potential you have for, like that saying, uh, what was it, Curse of the Snake People, in that episode, the potential you could have had to where they could have turned Goldie Gold into a, a snake person under the control of the guy just for that episode, or maybe two, would be huge. Would be freaking huge. I mean, again, these are just my opinions, but I really believe a property like Goldie Gold and Action Jack could really fit in today's world. Could really fit in today's mold. And, you know, you want to give Cartoon Network some of that action block again? This could do it. This would do 